I invite you to the book of the ages, the best book of wisdom I have ever read, the best entrepreneurial God I have ever read, the best plan of salvation that we have ever discovered in the gospel of St. Luke. Chapter number 15, I will use a very, very extremely familiar scripture and only excerpt a portion of it because it is so familiar that 90% of the people of the room would almost be able to quote it by heart. And yet, indulge me, if you will, in the luxury of extrapolating from this text an additional thought for the benefit of the hearer as we discuss the prodigal son. Not every man is a father, but all of us are sons. And if we become fathers, we do not forfeit our sonship for fatherhood. That duality of roles is of paramount importance because in the oldest man in the room, there is still a child. For that matter, in the oldest woman in the room, there is still a little girl. And at different moments and times, you are dealing with both of them. And this text is what I'm going to use to talk to all of the many different versions of you. <laughs> I told them yesterday, I said, there's so many people sitting in your chair. Yeah. There's so many versions of you, the happy you, the sad you, the restless you, the stable you, the impulsive you, the overlooked you, the curious you, the repentant you, the you that is given to mischief and the you that is given to wisdom all of them are wearing your clothes this morning. Midway's the story we start in the 15th verse of the 15th chapter of the Gospel of St. John. And it reads this wise out of the King James Version. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, talking about the prodigal son, left his father's house and went and joined a citizen of this far country who were not covenant keeping people. And when you join yourself to a different kind of person, they send you to do things you said you would never do. And he sent him into his fields to feed swine. So the prince has been sent into a field to feed swine. And he, it looked good to him. He would fain have filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat. And maybe he's hungry because no man gave unto him. When no man gives unto you, it creates a natural appetite. You cannot pour out what has not been poured in. And when he came to himself, <laughs> oh, I don't know what age that is. They told me it was 18. <laughs> but it's not. 
At 66, I am still coming to myself. Divesting myself of all the accruements that other people placed on me and finding out who I am outside of what you want me to be is a process. When he came to himself, he said, how many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and to spare? And I, 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 I perish with hunger. Anybody hungry? I will arise and go to my father and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned. Nobody talks about sin anymore. Father, I have sinned. Everybody has their own opinion. But he said, Father, I have sinned. His admission of his sin is what gives him access back to the Father. If you confess your sin, he is faithful and just to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Father, I have sinned. I have sinned against heaven and before thee. And I... I am no more worthy to be called thy son. I don't even deserve to be your son. Boy, you don't hear that much. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And he arose and came to his father, but when he was yet a great way off, listen to his fathers, his father saw him. Do you see your son? I mean, really see him when he was a great way off, not when he's doing what you want him to do, but when he's a great way off, there are a lot of young men who don't feel seen. His father saw him and had compassion, not rules, not mouth, not criticism, there has to come a time that you shut up and have compassion. And Rel ran and fell on his neck, yes, and he kissed his son. Because there is nothing wrong with being affectionate with your son. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and I am no more worthy to be called. I said, see, when when you don't feel worthy, even when you have an opportunity, you don't always activate because of guilt and shame. This cataclysmic moment was something the father waited a long time to see happen. Anybody waited a long time to see something happen? The Lord told me to tell you this, and this is my subject. It's worth the wait. I want you to look at somebody and tell them it's worth the wait. Father God, in the name of Jesus, as we approach thy throne, we do it humbly and submissively before you because thou art God and beside you there is no other. Release the kind of anointing that impacts people in definite ways, that changes them eternally, that heals wounds, that looses the bound, that sets the captive free. I thank you in advance for what you're going to do. Have your way, great God that you are. I trust you for things I can't even discuss. Manifest yourself in the midst of your people today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Rest easy, the work's on me. (laughs) 
This is a very interesting text. It is one of the few stories, parables, as it were, mentioned in the scriptures that is void of the presence of any woman at all. There is no female character in this text at all. If this text were taught today, it would be greatly criticized because now people quickly scan your page to see if they are represented properly in the text. You ain't. You are not in the text at all. This is a man's story. It is a story of three different men at three different ages and stages in their life, all coalesced together to develop a truth about a God who is explaining his love through a story about men. Now, this is not misogynistic by any stretch of the imagination. Let us be clear, because the Bible is full of women. From Eve forward, the Bible is full of women. From Eve to Bathsheba to Ruth, the Bible is full of women. From Jael to Naomi, the Bible is full of women, to the woman with the issue of blood, to the woman at the well, to Mary, the mother of Jesus. The Bible is full of stories, powerful, life-changing stories about women. It's interesting to note in this particular case, this father has sons that he could not have by himself. And yet the woman is not mentioned in the text at all. I must admit that there is, that the Bible is written in the midst of misogynistic times where women were not always valued. Consequently, many of the women who premiere in the text are often not even given names in the text. They are just referred to as the woman at the well, the woman with the issue. There is no discussion about what their names were. Oftentimes, men's names were mentioned more readily than women because in the times of the scriptures, the birth of a man-child was considered to be more weighty than a woman. Don't stone me. I'm just teaching. I am not saying that men are more valuable than women. I am saying that was the attitude of the times. And so we must put the text in context to understand the complexity of the text itself. The interesting thing also to note is that one of the things that I love about scripture, this particular verse starts out saying a certain man had two sons. That is not accidental. We will see that all throughout the scriptures. A certain man had two sons. A certain man like Adam had two sons, Cain and Abel. And when Abel was slaughtered, Seth was born. And still a certain man had two sons. There's Pharez and Zerah. There's Hophni and Phinehas. A certain man had two sons. There's Jacob and Esau. A certain man had 
two sons. There's God who has the first man, Adam, and the last man, Adam, a certain man had two sons. What I love about the Word of God, it does not show us just the grandiose ideologies of successful families that have no turbulence, but from the very first family, he warns us that families will be complicated, conflicted, dysfunctional. If the first family was dysfunctional, <laughs> The apple couldn't fall too far from the tree. As soon as God put the man in the garden and pulled out of him the woman and they started the first family, murder hit the first family. Is a clue that there is going to be turbulence the rest of the book with families. The law of first mention, the first family that's mentioned is dysfunctional and all the way throughout the rest of the book we see turbulence, we see rape, we see molestation, we see drunken fathers, we see ungrateful sons, we see the impediments of people who dress themselves up like prostitutes and slept with their father-in-law to get pregnant to produce children. This, if, if the Bible were to be cinematic, it would at least least be rated R. At least rated R because God is honest and vivid about the fact that life is messy. It's complicated. That's why you ought not to covet your neighbor because you're standing on the outside and on the outside every family looks good and stable and solid and sane and part of your pain comes from your comparison because you wish that your family were more like them but if you went inside the house you would find out that they are not everything that you thought that they were And maybe you better deal with the devil you know. <laughs> than the devil you don't. Family is tough. I would rather build a church any day than build a family. I would rather build a business any day than build a family. I would rather lay block then build a family, because Block don't have an opinion. Okay. Block don't talk back. It stays where you put it. Come on, somebody. But raising a family, see, every Block got a mouth, and every mouth has an opinion, and every opinion has to be expressed, and it is your job to hold together all of these different opinions and personalities and attitudes and dispositions and mood swings, and midlife crisis, and menopause, and adolescence. You gotta hold it together for a long time. There is no retiring from your family. There is no resigning from your family. You will always be attached to them. Don't believe your divorce papers. Just because you signed a release doesn't mean you're out of jail. Because the first time trouble rises, the first time they have a car wreck, the first time they get sick, the first time they get in trouble, they're going to call you and it's going to affect you. I know you said you don't care and it don't bother you, but you're going to have flashbacks because you got a brain and you're going to have a, how to, where are the real people at? Are y'all sitting in the section over here? 
flashback. Have you ever had a flashback? You broke up, but you still got a flashback, and you're a little worried, but you can't call, and you tell yourself you don't care, but you do, and you're walking around in the middle of the night with that little sick feeling in the bottom of your stomach because your stomach won't listen at your head and disconnect from the fact that you are still connected, though you are free on paper, you are still bound by experience, and families are messy business. We live in a time now that everybody wants everything quick. Quick love. Immediate gratification. I'm going to talk about some stuff you don't know about because you grew up on instant grits. But I remember when grits weren't instant. So what you call good grits, I just call gritty. Because real grits are slow cooked. Come on, talk to me, somebody. Real grits are slow cooked, take a long time to get the grits right. But that stuff y'all throwing in the microwave that you call grits is not really grits. Because if you want something to have real flavor, you got to slow cook it. You got to put it on a smoker. You got to give it some time. You can't cook collard greens in 15 minutes. It takes time to cook green. You, you, you got to put the meat in and let it boil down and let it thicken up and let it get a little flavor in it. Come on, somebody. You got to cut your greens and wash your greens and add them in at the right time and then cover them up and let it cook down, let all the juices cook down till you can't tell the greens from the broth. And see, we don't have time for that. We want instant sons and instant fathers and instant marriages. Listen, it takes 30 minutes to have a wedding. but it may take 30 years to have a marriage. And most of us, if we don't get what we need when we need it, like we need it in the style that we need it, in our love language, we're out of there. And all of these love languages sound like the United Nations to me. How am I supposed to know what your love language is? I'm still trying to figure out what my love language is. And when your love language and my love language and then the kids' love language gets in there, it sounds like the day of Pentecost. Touch me. No, give me space. Acknowledge me. No, don't make me stand up in front of people. Shut up! <laughs> the family started before the church. God knew he had to slow cook it because it was going to take a long time to get that right. He, did the, he didn't even bring up the church to the New Testament, but he started the family way back in the book of Genesis because he said, this is slow grits. We got to cook it real slow because the brothers are going to get jealous. And brothers do get jealous. They're going to murder and they're going to kill and they're going to be envious, some vocally, some silently. But it takes a long time to have a family. And we're in trouble. Our communities are in trouble. Our nation is in trouble and our world is in trouble, but all of it is only because our families are in trouble. 
How can you have a strong community and a weak family? You must understand that the community is made up of families. It is in your family that you learn authority, that you learn order, that you have protocol, that you have di- used to, anyway, I'm sorry, used to, I'm old folky, used to have discipline. That's where you learn your art, your skill, your talent, your rules, your regulation, what time to go to bed, it's nine o'clock, go to bed, go to bed, clean your room, wash your drawers, clean yourself up in case you have a wreck. did understand what a wreck had to do with clean draws. He dead, but he has. <laughs> Mama, I died, but my draws was clean. They cut both my legs off, but my draws were sparkling white. This is messy, this is complicated, this is difficult, this is tough. It is tough because the star of the story is seemingly the the son. The biggest fool in the text has the lead role. The most selfish, self-aggrandized, aloof individual in the whole story has the lead role. The father is the supporting cast. And that's what it means to be a father. To be the supporting cast. It's your job to support. And nobody preaches about the father. They always preach about the son. They sing songs about the son. They do sermons and poetry on the son. Nobody says anything about the father. And the father is the one who held everything together. but it hurt. It hurt. And just because a man doesn't cry does not mean that he doesn't hurt. This is how I look when I'm happy. This is how I look when I'm getting ready to knock your head off. (laughs) This is how I look when I'm scared. (laughs) And some of our homes are busting up because you expect my face to radiate my emotions like yours does when in reality, I can feel everything you feel and go. When they bring me bad news, I take it like this. When they bring me good news, I take it like this. And just because the father didn't cry, didn't mean he didn't hurt. And unfortunately, we live in a society that gives empathy and compassion to that that is visible. 
So the more invisible you become with how you feel, the less compassion you receive. because they start saying, that's just how he is. You built for this. You can do it. You can handle it because I took it like this. Inside, I wanted to die. I wanted to throw up. But I took it like this. The father doesn't get the lead role because he's not given enough drama now. He probably did when he was younger. <laughs> but drama dries up with age. <laughs> it's like a ward, it just dries up and shrinks down and calms down. The younger son said to his father, give me the portion of goods that falleth unto me. Who says anything falls to you? Exactly. What entitlement that you think just because you're my son that something is supposed to fall to you, that I owe you something, I had you. I did that, I had you, you here. Glory, that's your inheritance, you breathe. <laughs> My son said, thank you for it. <laughs> he comes to his father with a spirit of entitlement, expecting his father to give him his inheritance. Wait a minute, inheritance is what you get when I die. So you mean you're in such a hurry to get what I got that you can't wait on me to die? You want me to get out the way because you would rather have the gift than the giver? You'd rather have the seed than the sower? You'd rather have the healing than the healer? That's what you mean every time you pray in the emergency room to a God that you don't serve. You want him to heal you, but you don't want to have a relationship with the healer. Don't act like you don't understand the prodigal son, because there's a whole lot of prodigal sons and daughters in this room who only come to God when they get in trouble. And as soon as the trouble is over, we don't see you no more because you pray prayers like, Lord, if you just get me out of... Can I go deeper? Give me the portion of goods that falleth unto me. And, 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 and then it says something that is the most telling. He divided unto them both of them, his living. His living. His living. How much is that? His living. His life. See, see, whatever he had accumulated, he had spent his life to get it. So when he gave it to his sons, it wasn't that he was giving him money. He was giving them his life. He divided unto them his living. I have given you my life. While you pick through it and tell me what's wrong with the gift, how it should have been wrapped and how it should have been handled and what should have been done with it. It was my life. I could have had it without you. I could have had it without you. I could have went to Paris and I could have went to France, but I sent you to school. 
I could have went to Venice. I could have been in Italy. I could have been in Rome. I could have went to Afghanistan. I could have taken trips to Dubai, but I paid your tuition with my life. That hat on your head is my life. That ring on your finger is my life. And he divided unto them his living. And that's okay. Because if you're really a father, you should love your seed enough to invest your life. Stay with me, I'm going somewhere. Yeah, because if I'm going to give my life to anybody, I should give it to my seed. If I were going to die right now and I had to pick out who I was going to give my, 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 my life to, I would give it to my seed first. The problem is he divided unto them his living, not their living, his living, and the prodigal son took his living and went a whoring. He spent it on sluts. and tramps and parties and fake friends. Yeah. He spent it in strip clubs and hookah bars and having parties and dropping it like it's hot and making it rain up in here. He, he made it rain. He made it rain. You don't get it. He made it rain with his father's life. I gave you my life and you bought weaves. <laughs> to impress men who gave you nothing. <laughs> it's Father's Day. It's Father's Day. And I had to sit here and watch you waste my living, knowing I would not get another one, knowing this is my last run, knowing that I'm running out of time, knowing that I won't get a do-over again and I had to watch you blow it and listen that you tell me what I should have done. Because even though you haven't done it, you seem to know how to do it. If another childless person tells me how to be a father, I'll scream. I know this is gonna get me on TikTok for sure, but here I go. If another woman tells me how to be a father, I will open my mouth and flat out scream. I, you can no more tell me how to be a father than I can tell you how to birth a baby. I don't know nothing about birthing a baby. I don't know nothing about nursing a child. You have to know what you don't know. Shut up being the teacher and just be the wife. be a father. Not only are you not a father, most of you didn't even have a father, and yet you're an expert on how to be. But that's all right, I'm not gonna bother you because you're not in the text, that's all right, I'm sorry. I got off the text, let me get back to the text. I'm not gonna bother you today and all your ideas and all the stuff you read in Essence and Woman's Today and all the things you heard at the beauty shop about what a man ought to be, I'm not gonna bother it today because you're an expert on something you have never done. I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave you alone. I'm not gonna try to argue with you because you talk faster than me, go ahead. But just because you out talk me doesn't mean you change my mind.
That's why I looked at you like this when you're talking. And there you are. I want you to feel what the father felt when the son walked out the door with his life and blew it. It's not like he went there and increased it and invested it and grew from it and multiplied it and did something with it. He took everything I told him and everything I taught him and everything I gave him and everything I put inside of him and gave it to sluts that never appear again in the text. Riotous living. And to all of that, the father said nothing. That's amazing. He said absolutely nothing because he had, he had to. <clears throat> he had to wait. He had to wait when it looked like it wasn't going to pay off. I know that's right. He had to wait when it looked like he was a failure. He had to wait when it looked like it didn't work. He had to wait when it looked like it didn't matter. He had to wait while they went on without him. He had to sit there and wait. Jesus. He had to wait while he was running out of time. Yeah. He's running out of time. The boy has more time than the father. Yeah. It is not the oldest son. It is the youngest son. He has the most time and the least sense. And the old man with the least time and the most sense has to sit back. Jesus. Help, help. And just wait. Waiting is so hard that the Bible said, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. That means you expend energy just waiting. I'm just waiting. I'm just waiting. I'm tired from waiting. I'm weak from waiting. I need revival just to wait. And so he waited. Yeah, yeah. Because good grits. <laughs> he waited while he spent his money at payday loans. He waited while he made dumb decisions. He waited while he got tied up with people that never meant him no good. He waited. While the young man valued his friends more than his father, he waited. While his fake friends who were only with him for the money and the opportunity that he got because he had a father who helped him to be who he was, he had to wait. While the son picked his friends over his father, he had to wait. And he didn't say a word. Brothers, shut up. They can't see it till they see it. They can't know it till they know it. They can't be it till they be it. They can't see it just like you couldn't see it when you were their age. They can't see it either. And you have to, the Bible says in patience, you possess your soul. You possess your mind. You keep yourself from a nervous breakdown. When you develop patience, you have to know that you shall bring forth fruit in your own season. And your leaf shall not wither, and whatsoever you do shall prosper. But it's not the boy's season. You gotta wait on that girl to grow up. 
Yes, she's going to act a fool. Yes, she's going to do stupid things. Yes, she might come home pregnant. Yes, she might get on drugs. Yes, your heart is broken. Yes, you feel like you're a disappointment. Yes, you feel like a failure. At your most vulnerable age, you feel like I failed. I put everything I had in you and look at you, but you got to wait. I don't know who I'm preaching to, but I feel like I'm preaching. I'm preaching to somebody today. See, we have lost our ability to wait. If the marriage don't work out in the first three years, we're out of there. If we're not happy in the first five years, we're out of there. You don't understand how long it takes for two different people from two different worlds and two different family backgrounds to mess together and figure out how to make this work. You ain't going to be happy every day. I can't make you happy. I'm trying to make me happy. I don't even know what I want. How do you expect me to know what you want? I don't know what you want, and I can't make you happy. And so, so the old man waited. This Jewish boy has gotten tied up with some Gentile people. Wait a minute. You couldn't stay with me and I loved you. And now you have attached yourself to a citizen of that country. And I had to wait while you gave them honor. You couldn't be attached to me. Wow. But you attach yourself to the Gentiles who sent you out there to feed what I would never feed you. For a Jew to eat swine was a curse. And the moment they got his attention, they sent him to the hog pen, not to eat the swine, to feed the swine. And the boy is so low in his vision and his self-esteem that now he's craving stuff that he's never been exposed to at home. And it's not that he was about to have a ham sandwich or some barbecued ribs. He was lusting after corn husk. Y'all are city people, you don't know nothing about a hog pen. A hog pen stinks. It's full of slop and feces and mud. And this son at his lowest estate, you can tell he's at his lowest estate because when you get down to your lowest, stuff that never looked good to you starts looking good to you. Stuff that you weren't attracted to, you start being attracted to. Things you said you'd never do, now you start doing them. And now he would fain have filled his belly with that which the swine did eat. Because he was hungry. I'm not blaming him, he was hungry. But while he was hungry, there was food at his father's house. If a man gets hungry enough, you'll eat anything. You'll do anything. I understand that. I know what it is to be desperate. I want to talk to some desperate young men in this place right now when you get desperate. Stop telling people what you won't do. Stop telling people where you won't go. Stop telling people what you won't smoke. Stop telling people what you won't drink. Stop telling people who you won't sleep with. That's because you're not hungry. If you get hungry enough, 
Oh, you got to sit there and act like you don't know what I'm talking about. You got to sit there with your church face on and act like you haven't done anything that you thought you would never do. You got to sit there and look at me on this Father's Day and act like you ain't got no mess, no secrets, no stuff you don't want nobody to know about. Like you have never been to the hog pen. You such a phony. That's why I'm full with church folk. I want to talk to some real people who have done some nasty shit stuff, some stinking stuff, some wretched stuff, some stuff you had to blindfold yourself to do. I want to talk to some people that looked at corn husks and thought it was sexy. has broken his own values and his own rules and his own integrity and everything I put in him and everything I put on him and now he's down in the hog pen where my parenting is tested. My parenting is not tested when you're in my house. My parenting is tested when you leave. My parenting is not tested at 9 o'clock in the evening. My parenting is tested at 3 o'clock in the morning. My parenting is not tested when I'm driving you to the prom. My parenting is tested when you got your own car and you're over somebody else's house you shouldn't be over. My parenting is tested when you fell in love with that married man. My parenting is tested when that boy got ready to kill you over a girl who was just using you for your money. You don't have to be a father to understand this pain. Because there's a whole lot of women in this room who have been raising children and you know what it is to walk the floor at three o'clock in the morning and you can't fix it and you can't stop it and they won't talk to you and they won't take your calls and they won't listen to you and all you can do is wait. You tried fussing and it didn't work. You tried cussing and it didn't work. You tried praying and it didn't work. You spoke in tongues and it got worse. They went to jail, they got in trouble and even on this day some of you are hurting because the people you love are locked up. And he would fain have filled his belly with that which the swine did eat. And all while he was about to eat slop. Have you ever waited on somebody you love? Have you ever waited on them to call you? Have you ever picked up your phone and kept looking for a text? Have you ever waited on somebody to miss you? looked out the window. He waited, not knowing if he would ever see him alive again, not knowing if the ambulance had just passed by, was carrying my son, my child, my wife, my future, whatever it is you're waiting on. I'm, I'm wondering if it's going to get back. Is it ever going to get back? Is it ever going to come home. It's not just waiting, it's worrying. It's worrying and waiting and worrying and waiting. See, the worry is the torment that the devil leaves with the waiter so that you can't get comfortable in the waiting. That's why you have to wait on the Lord and have your strength renewed so you can fight off the worry. All the images that come to your mind, all the coulda, woulda, shoulda, all the this might happen, that might happen, this might die, that might die, that, that this might happen. 
happen. And there he is where his father can't help him, where his father can't reach him, where his father can't touch him. And he's already spent everything that his father put in him and now he's down to nothing. And that's when we find out what you're really made of. When you're down to nothing, when all hell has broken loose in your life and it looks like you'll never get back up again. That's when we find out, are you a man? I don't know you're a man while you got money. I know you're a man when you're broke. I know you're a man when you're backed in a corner and you're shoved to the wall. And if you don't fight your way out, you won't get out. That's when I find out what you're really made of. And I don't know what the father did wrong. I, every father does something wrong, something stupid, something crazy. And all while you're waiting, you don't have nothing to think about, but maybe if I'd spent more time, maybe if I'd have took him to the movies, maybe if I'd have been at the football game, maybe if I'd have been at the dance, maybe he wouldn't be in the hall here. Maybe it's my fault. Maybe it's, I'm talking about guilt. I'm talking about guilt. I'm talking to the men, but I'm really talking to everybody because this is genderless. Th these feelings are genderless. They don't have nothing really to do with gender. I'm talking about guilt. Maybe I should have said something. Maybe if I'd have fixed a sandwich before they died. If, maybe if I'd have went to the hospital that night. Maybe if I'd have went and got them out of jail. Maybe, maybe, maybe if I'd have drove down to the crack house. Maybe, maybe if I'd have fought a little harder. Maybe if I'd have argued one more time. Maybe if I'd have pleaded. Maybe if I'd have started crying. Maybe if I'd have sat down in the floor. Maybe, maybe. But these are the thoughts of the waiter yeah. while you wait. Maybe if I'd have been a better wife, he wouldn't have left me. Maybe if I'd have been a better husband, she wouldn't have cheated on. Maybe, 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 maybe it's the thoughts that run through the mind of the people who are waiting. And maybe the waiting isn't worth it. Maybe I'll never see him again. Maybe my son is dead. All of this Jesus teaches to tell you what God goes through. See, see, you think I'm talking about Father's Day, but I'm not. All of this Jesus is teaching is to illustrate to you what God goes through with you while you spend everything he gave you in riotous living and being irresponsible and going in your own way, what you don't realize is that God is waiting on you. He's, he's looking at the watch. He's watching. I gave you a chance. I gave you another chance. I gave you another chance. I gave you another chance. I'm waiting on you. I'm waiting on you to come back home. I still love you. I still want you. I'll take you back even though your friends have dropped you, your girlfriends have dropped you, the harlots have dropped you, the money is gone, I'll take you broke, I'll take you stinking, I'll take you dirty, I'll take you smelling like feces, I'll take you any kind of way I can get you back. I so love you that I'm willing to do whatever I got to do to get you back. This is not just about the love of a father. Everybody doesn't have a father who loves them like that. This is the love of our father, our God, who so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, his living, that whosoever believeth on him shall not perish but have everlasting life, and you are making him And so the Bible says that there was this moment, there was this moment in his life. Oh my God, Lord have mercy. There was this moment in his life, this epiphany, this divine awakening, this illumination, this, this, this apocalyptic unveiling of truth that he came to himself.
and he wasn't in church and he wasn't in prayer meeting and he wasn't in Bible class. You don't have to be in a special place to come to yourself. Sometimes you can wake up in your own bed. Sometimes you can come to yourself in a nightclub. Sometimes you can come to yourself in the street. Sometimes you can be half drunk and have an epiphany and say, wait a minute, I'm better than this. I know better than this. I come from better stuff than this. I'm meant for more than this. Surely my destiny doesn't end here. Surely my life doesn't end here. Surely I was made for better than this. Surely, surely, surely. No choir, no praise team, no preachers, no singers, no dancers. He came to himself. And I'm wondering if there's anybody in here that's having a moment. Where you come to yourself. I came to myself. Wait, that's a strange statement. I came to church this morning. I came to the potter's house. That's travel. That's distance. That's time. That's motion. That's movement. That's logistics. I came to myself. You mean I have to travel to get to me? You mean I have to get on the road and start the car to find who I really am? Yes, it takes a long time to come to yourself, to come to yourself where you really know who you are. He came to himself without moving his body. He's still in the hall pen. They're still snorting. They're still stinking. It's still dirty. It's still a mess. But nothing that hell sends against you can stop you from coming to yourself. I don't care what you're surrounded by. I don't care who's around you. I don't care what it looks like. I don't care what you did and who you did it with. When you get ready to come to yourself, you can come to yourself. I wish I had a witness. Is there anybody in here? that ever came to yourself. Holla at your boy. Watch the order. He came to himself and said to himself, how you talk to yourself determines where you go. <laughs> he talked himself into trouble. Now he has to talk himself out. He says, I will arise and go to my father's house. Glory to God. But he knows who he is now. This is me, daddy. I'm dirty, but it's me. I'm stinking, but it's me. I'm broke, but it's me. I'm messed up, but it's me. I'm hurting, but it's me. I'm hungry, but it's me. I've been a fool, but it's me. I finally figured out who I am. I spent all your money. I messed up all your stuff. I spent your time and your life and your energy, but I came to myself. And listen, watch this young man, listen good. He is so afraid of being rejected that he is rehearsing I will say to my father he ain't even there yet is he but he's practicing this time I'm saying I'm saying I'm no more worthy to be called thy son. make me one of your hired servants and he's driving down the road trying to get his speech together because He don't even know his father loved him. He don't even know that his father's been waiting on him. He is preparing to convince his father to take him back. And his father is sitting at home. Sometimes your fear is lying to you. Your fear is telling you that I'm mad about the money. 
that I'm mad about the time I, I wasted, I'm, that I'm mad about how you spent my stuff. And your fear and your guilt makes you think you got to rehearse. It ain't what you're going to say to me. It's what I'm going to say to you. And he's rehearsing. I will say to my father, I'm no more worthy to be called that son. And I'm not even going to ask him to get my bedroom back or anything like that. And I'm not going to ask him for a robe or a ring or anything like that because I know I messed up and I'm not worthy to be his son. But if he just make me a hired servant, I'm going to tell him, I'm going to come all the way down. I'm going to humble down. And when I talk to him, I'm just going to say, I'm not, I'm not expecting you to give me back the privileges that I blew. I'm not expecting you to love me like you loved me before I messed up. I'm not expecting you to take me back the way you took me before, but if, it, if I could just work in the house, if I could clean the floor, if I could mop the floor, if I could cut the grass, if I could do something in the yard, I, just make me one of your hard servants. And this is what he's practicing to go back. And what he's saying to himself contradicts what the father is waiting on. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying? Because he's saying stuff that the father's not feeling. The father doesn't feel like you're no more worthy to be my son. I disown you. I don't want you. I don't love you. I don't need you. The father wants his son to come home. Not a servant. He wants his son to come home. He wants his son to come back before he dies. He wants his son to come back while he can see him. So the man you're getting ready to talk to is not the man that's waiting. It's the man you imagine. <laughs> you came to yourself, you know who you are, but you don't know who I am. That part, oh my. You don't know how fast I would run. <laughs> Oh, I can't look at you and do this. Let me go somewhere else. You don't know how fast I would run to get you. You don't know that I would break my back to get you back. And the Bible says, while he was yet a great ways off, It wasn't after he got in the choir and joined the deacon board and cleaned up his act and stopped smoking, stopped drinking, stopped smelling like dope. No, no. While he was yet a great ways off, while he was still smelling like a pot factory, while he was still, eyes was glazed over, while he was still snorting cocaine, while, while he was yet a great ways off, the father saw him. Jesus is teaching us about God the Father so that we can get some indication about how to be a father. The father don't run down there talking, you mean you spent all my money, you wasted everything, and you've been out there with them tramps and them sluts, and now we're down to nothing, and here you come back here, and you think you're going to move back in your house and come back in here. The devil is a lie. You must be out there. No! The Bible says that the father was moved with compassion. Men, stop being so hard that you lose compassion. So what he was wrong? So what he was taken? So what he was with the swine? He's still your child. Some of you act like you love your rules more than you love your son. This old man has no rules. This old man, this old man. At my age, you don't run over everything. It has to be something really serious for you to run over it. I might walk over, I might take a scoot over, but if I come running, you either need to open your arms or duck. 
What would make an old man run? If you see a son that's a great ways off. God said, if, if you not even close to right and I see you coming, If I see you trying to be clean, if I see you trying to get yourself together, if I see you trying to stand up, if I see you trying to be responsible, I will run out to meet you. You ain't even got to come all the way back. I don't need your speech. I just need to see you coming. If I see you coming, I'll run out there to get you. seven people and tell them God is on the run. God is on the run. He's on the run. He's on the run. He's on the run this morning. He's on the run. He's on the run this morning. He's on the run. He's on the run. He's on the run. I don't know who he's after this morning, but he's on the run. He's on the run. He's on the run. God is on the run. God is on the run. God is on the run this morning. God is on the run. God is on the run. He's chasing you. He's longing for you. He's looking for you. He's turning over stuff trying to find you. God wants you back. I don't care what you did. I don't care who you did it with. God is on the run. God is chasing you down. God wants you back. What made the father run is that the boy was worth the wait. Watch this, you still don't get it. The one who's coming back saying, I'm not worth it. I'm not worth it. It's the one that the father thinks he's worth the wait. And he's worth the run. I don't care if you're 70 or 17. This word is for you. I don't care if you're a woman in the balcony or a little boy in the back. I don't care who you've attached yourself to and made a fake family out of them and you're more loyal to them than you are those who put the most in you. And I know you made some dumb decisions and you blew my living, but you're worth it. And I may be the only one in the whole story who still believes you're worth it. You don't get it, you don't even believe it. But when I see you coming, I think you're worth it. And in that moment, while the son is talking out of his shame, you know what the father's talking about? Bring me the robe, kill the fatted calf, bring the ring and put it on his finger. This my son who was dead is alive again. I'm gonna throw a party for a failure and a reject. Because I so love you. It's not just that I love you. I can't even help it. I can't stop it. I loved you when you took the money. I loved you when you spent the money. 
I loved you when you didn't come home. I love you when you ignore me and acted like them other people were more valuable than me. I loved you then. I so love you. I'll take you back muddy. I'll take you back with your flies and your gnats all around you. I'll take you back stinky. I'll put my robe over your dirtiest secret and I will cover you up because I so You ain't live till you love like that. You ain't live till you love like that. If only people you love is nice, neat, cool people who got it together and they fine and they educated and they smell good and they look good, you don't know nothing about love. Get out of here. <laughs> love will make you turn somebody over and clean them up. And I don't know, I don't know if I have done well enough at this to accomplish what God wanted me to accomplish. But the Lord said to me that you are worth the wait. And if you would just Try to come. If, if, if you just, if, if you just start to do better, the old man run out to meet you. He misses you. He miss you. Jesus. You're looking for love in all them other places. He, he thinks you're worth it. Oh, God. He thought I was worth saving. Oh, he thought I... He thought I was. He thought it, I was worth dying for. He thought I was worth shedding his blood to get back. And even when I thought I was a bad deal, I told him myself, I told him, I said, Lord, why would you want me? You ain't getting nothing. I said, this is a bad deal. I said, I, I can't do this. We started arguing when I was 17. I started preaching when I was 19. And I can't believe I'm 66 and still doing it. He thought stuff about me that I didn't think about myself. And I had evidence not to think highly of myself. But my, his evidence was stronger than mine. His evidence was a cross. 